but once more, If it be so, what then? Why are our hearts so cold? And why is it that we do so little for him who has done so much for us? Jesus, art thou mine? Am I saved? How is it that I love thee so little? Why is it that when I preach I am not more in earnest, and when I pray I am not more intensely fervent? How is it that we give so little to Christ, who gave himself for us? How is it that we serve him so sadly, who served us so perfectly? He consecrated himself wholly. How is it that our consecration is marred and partial? We are continually sacrificing to self and not to him. O oh, beloved, yield yourselves up this morning. What have you got in the world? O oh, says one, I have nothing. I am poor and penniless and all but houseless. Give thyself to Christ. You have heard the story of the pupils to a Greek philosopher. On a certain day it was the custom to give to the philosopher a present. One came and gave him gold. Another could not bring him gold, but brought him silver. One brought him a robe, and another some delicacy for food. But one of them came up and said, O oh, Solon, I am poor. I have nothing to give to thee. But yet I will give thee something better than all these have given. I give thee myself. Now if you have gold and silver, if you have aught of this world's goods, give in your measure to Christ. But take care above all that you give yourself to him. And let your cry be from this day forth, do not I love thee, dearest Lord? O oh, search my heart and see, and turn each cursed idol out that dares to rival thee. Do not I love thee from my soul? Then let me nothing love. Dead be my heart to every joy when Jesus cannot move. Well, now I have all but done. But give your solemn, very solemn attention while I come to my last head. If it is not so, what then? Dear hearer, I cannot tell where thou art, but wherever thou mayest be in this hall, the eyes of my heart are looking for thee, that when they have seen thee, they may weep over thee. Ah, miserable wretch, without a hope, without Christ, without God, unto thee there is no Christmas mirth. For thee no child is born, to thee no son is given. Sad is the story of the poor men and women who during the week before last fell down dead in our streets through cruel hunger and bitter cold. But far more pitiable is thy lot, far more terrible shall be thy condition in the day when thou shalt cry for a drop of water to cool thy burning tongue, and it shall be denied thee, when thou shalt seek for death for grim, cold death. Seek for him as for a friend, and yet thou shalt not find him. For the fire of hell shall not consume thee, nor its terrors devour thee. Thou shalt long to die, yet shalt thou linger in eternal death, dying every hour, yet never receiving the much-coveted boon of death. What shall I say to thee this morning? O oh, Master, Help me to speak a word in season now. I beseech thee, my hearer, if Christ is not thine this morning, may God the Spirit help thee to do what I now command thee to do. First of all, confess thy sins, not into my ear, nor into the ear of any living man. Go to thy chamber and confess that thou art vile. Tell him thou art a wretch undone without his sovereign grace. But do not think there is any merit in confession. There is none. All your confession cannot merit forgiveness, though God has promised to pardon the man who confesses his sin and forsakes it. Imagine that some creditor had a debtor who owed him a thousand pounds. He calls upon him and says, I demand my money. But, says the other, I owe you nothing. That man will be arrested and thrown into prison. However, his creditor says, I wish to deal mercifully with you. Make a frank confession, and I will forgive you all the debt. 
Well, says the man, I do acknowledge that I owe you two hundred pounds. No, says he, that will not do. Well, sir, I confess I owe you five hundred pounds. And by degrees he comes to confess that he owes the thousand. Is there any merit in that confession? No. But yet you could see that no creditor would think of forgiving a debt which was not acknowledged. It is the least that you can do to acknowledge your sin. And though there be no merit in the confession, yet, true to his promise, God will give you pardon through Christ. That is one piece of advice. I pray you take it. Do not throw it to the winds. Do not leave it as soon as you get out of Exeter Hall. Take it with you, and may this day become a confession day with many of you. But next, when you have made a confession, I beseech you, renounce yourself. You have been resting perhaps in some hope that you would make yourself better and so save yourself. Give up that delusive fancy. You have seen the silkworm. It will spin and spin and spin, and then it will die where it has spun itself a shroud. And your good works are but a spinning for yourself, a robe for your dead soul. You can do nothing by your best prayers, your best tears, or your best works to merit eternal life. Why, the Christian who is converted to God will tell you that he cannot live a holy life by himself. If the ship in the sea cannot steer itself aright, do you think the wood that lies in the carpenter's yard can put itself together and make itself into a ship and then go out to sea and sail to America? Yet this is just what you imagine. The Christian who is God's workmanship can do nothing, and yet you think you can do something. Now give up self. God help you to strike a black mark through every idea of what you can do. Then lastly, and I pray God help you here, my dear hearers, when thou hast confessed thy sin and given up all hope of self-salvation, go to the place where Jesus died in agony. Go then in meditation to Calvary. There he hangs. It is the middle cross of these three. Methinks I see him now. I see his poor face emaciated, and his visage more marred than that of any man. I see the beady drops of blood still standing round his pierced temples, marks of that rugged thorn crown. Ah, I see his body naked, naked to his shame. We may tell all his bones. See there his hands rent with the rough iron, and his feet torn with the nails. The nails have rent through his flesh. There is now not only the hole through which the nail was driven, but the weight of his body has sunken upon his feet, and see the iron is tearing through his flesh. Now the weight of his body hangs upon his arms, and the nails there are rending through the tender nerves. Hark! Earth is startled. He cries, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. O oh, sinner, was ever shriek like that? God hath forsaken him. His God has ceased to be gracious to him. His soul is exceeding sorrowful, even unto death. But hark again, he cries, I thirst. Give him water, give him water. Ye holy women, let him drink. But no, his murderers torture him. They thrust into his mouth the vinegar mingled with gall, the bitter with the sharp, the vinegar and the gall. At last, hear him, sinner, for here is your hope. I see him bow his awful head. The king of heaven dies. The God who made the earth has become a man, and the man is about to expire. Hear him! He cries, It is finished! And he gives up the ghost. The atonement is finished. The price is paid. The bloody ransom counted down. The sacrifice is accepted. It is finished! Sinner, believe in Christ! 
cast thyself on him. Sink or swim, take him to be thy all in all. Throw now thy trembling arms around that bleeding body. Sit now at the feet of that cross and feel the dropping of the precious blood. And as you go out, each one of you say in your hearts, A guilty, weak, and helpless worm, on Christ's kind arms I fall. He is my strength and righteousness, my Jesus and my all. God grant you grace to do so, for Jesus Christ's sake. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Ghost be with you all forever and ever. Amen and amen.